from innocent shepherd boy to rugged man of God. That's the transition that we see David make as we continue our journey through 1 Samuel here on Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and I'm so glad that you're choosing to make God's Word a priority in your life today. You won't be disappointed. So while you hop aboard the Bible bus and find your seat, Greg and I have got a quick update on what's happening with God's Word around the world. Yeah, Steve, and from time to time, we like to answer the question, what's new in, yep. in, through the Bible? And, of course, the the way that most people hear that is, oh, what's new in that something you've never done before that's new? But there's so many other elements of what's new in through the Bible, and one of them is when we finish a cycle and then start another cycle. Yes, and yeah. we've done that multiple times in English, and yeah. we're also doing that in all of our foreign languages. Yeah, so for, for example, uh, just after this hits the air, we are going to complete the Twi, which is a, a language spoken in Ghana in Western Africa. We're going to finish the third cycle of the Twi broadcast. Wow. And, I mean, we're on the 11th cycle here in North America, which yeah. is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, And also, I want to point out, we shouldn't take for granted that people hear the whole five years in English or any other language and say, uh, you know, you'd think normally they might say, well, thank you. We heard it. No way. We (laughs) are (laughs) we are a forgetful people. God has made us with a forgetful mind, unfortunately. And sin has had a little bit to do with crowding our brain and Uh, corrupting it. So that's why you need to be in God's word every day. And that's why this thing repeats. Absolutely, absolutely, because those of us that have heard Dr. McGee multiple times, it's amazing how he he will say something, and I'll be I'll be feeling as if wow, that's a new insight, and I think well, why didn't you hear that the first couple I, yep, of times? Absolutely. So I don't feel so bad. But let me just share a little bit. Twee is a very dynamic ministry. Actually, you can see here on my laptop, we have some pictures of a radio studio. Um, and this is this is a story we've told before, but this is worth repeating because we are a forgetful people. Steve. Yes, did you know that? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in Kumasi, which is a city uh, in Ghana, where the TTB Twi ministry is thriving, mainly because we have a morning radio host who spends time talking about through the Bible during his show. He's also very good at getting audience engagement to the early morning airing of through the Bible. And the pictures are of a couple of the TWR team members that went and visited, yeah. and they get they get thousands of people engaging on Facebook. And he actually, if you see some of these pictures here, he actually got 150 people to come to the studio one day for a special celebration. Wow. So all we wanted to do today was give you an insight that new things are happening all the time, even in the historic ministry of yeah, through the Bible. They sure are. That is such an encouragement. Greg, let me uh, let me pray for us as we begin our study. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that even though we are a forgetful people, you have mercy on us and grace, and you give us your word. You give us new days every morning and an opportunity to study your word every day. I pray, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for each one of us, that as we spend this time in First Samuel and looking at, at the life of David, that you would apply it to our lives and that we would have a better understanding of who you are because of your great grace and mercy shown to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today, friends, we bring our study to the 24th chapter of 1 Samuel, and we continue on with David. David now is fleeing from Saul. He's being hounded. This was a period of testing in the life of David, and it, I think, changed him from a little innocent shepherd boy to a rugged man who became God's man and ruled over his people. But we find in this chapter here that David again spares Saul's life here at En Gedi. And the reason that he does it, he'll make very clear. We'll see that. Now, let me move into this chapter 1 Samuel 24, verse 1, and I'm reading. And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goat. Now, that means that David has really gone to a rugged place to hide out. And he does not have, we know, 3,000 men. Saul's 
army greatly outnumbered David, but David could make up with strategy and the fact that he knew the area and his men were rugged men indeed. Now notice verse 2, Then Saul took these 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel, and he went to seek David. And it was upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats by the way, where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. Now Saul came into the very cave that David was hiding. And he goes to sleep. Well, of course, his men are on guard, but they are on guard outside, not on the inside of the cave. They're permitting the king to have privacy in order that he might get a good nap. Well, notice what happens. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I'll deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. That is, he quietly and privately slipped up and just trimmed off the lower part of the garment of King Saul. Now it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he'd cut off Saul's skirt. He regretted he'd done that because actually it was a source of embarrassment. Imagine when Saul waked up and stood up and he's in a miniskirt. Well, that is something that even in that day, kings didn't do, was go around in miniskirts. Now, will you notice verse 6? He said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Now, what David is doing here is honoring the office, not the man. He respects the office, not the man. May I just interject this at this particular point? I personally do not think that the president of the United States, regardless of what party he belongs to, or regardless of who he is or how bad he might be, I do not think that he should ever be made a subject of a cartoon, are the object of ridicule. Uh, He can be criticized in a democracy, of course, but to make him a subject of ridicule, as the cartoonists do of our presidents, I think it's entirely wrong, and for comedians to attempt to imitate them. Now, that's just my personal opinion, but I think that we ought to have more respect for the office than we do, because you and I live in a country that has its faults, but it's been a great country and a good country to most of us, and it's because of the form of government we've had so far. I do not know what the future holds, but this is my comment relative to that, and you will notice at least how David, and David is being hunted by this man. David won't lay a hand on him. Why? Because of the fact that he's God's anointed, and he's going to let God deal with him. My, if we could only get to the place where we'd let God handle our enemies. Most of us want to handle them. But God can do a better job. You remember he said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And that simply means this. God says that when you and I take these things in our own hands, we're no longer walking by faith. We're not trusting him. What we're really saying is, Lord, we can't trust you to handle this as we want it handled, so we're going to take it in our hands. And David now is going to let God handle King Saul. And I think the Lord will do a pretty good job, by the way, before he's through with him. And David now is really embarrassed. The fact of the matter is his conscience disturbs him because he actually is making the king a subject of ridicule. Imagine a man standing up with a miniskirt on. That's exactly what happened. Now, verse 7, So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. He would not permit his men. And I'll tell you, several of those men had no use for him, and they would have killed him in a moment. But David would not permit it. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. And David also rose afterward and went out of his cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. 
You see, he respects him. It's the office, not the man. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt? Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave, and some bade me kill thee, but mine eyes spared thee. And I said, I'll not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he's the Lord's anointed. And actually, he's demonstrated now to King Saul he's not seeking his life. Saul has been told, wrongly of course, David was much misunderstood, but he's much maligned also and misrepresented by both friend and enemy, I think. And so we find here he's making it clear to Saul that he was not seeking his life at all. Now I'm going to drop down because what you have here is David makes it very clear to Saul that he's not seeking his life. And he would like to have had Saul let up from hunting him. But actually this just really antagonizes this man Moa because he actually at this time I'm of the opinion he's demon-possessed. An evil spirit came upon him. Verse 20 now, let me read these last three verses. And now behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. Now will you notice Saul's statement here? This is something that is quite amazing. Saul knew it and is greatly moved by what David does. We're told here that he wept. And now he acknowledges that he knows that he is to be king. And he says here now, Swear now therefore unto me by the Lord, that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me, and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore unto Saul, and Saul went home. But David and his men get them up into the hole. David doesn't trust him, you see. David gets farther and farther into the wilderness to hide because he knows there'll come a day when Saul will come after him again. Now, this man, David, is a very remarkable man, and this next chapter, chapter 25, reveals it. We have here, actually, the death of Samuel in his retirement. And then we find that David encounters Nabal and Abigail. And David was right on the verge here of committing a very rash act. And a very wonderful woman by the name of Abigail prevented him from doing it. This is one of the high points in the life of David. Now, before we get to that, let me read the first verse of chapter 25 of 1 Samuel. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. David now is actually moving farther away because he knows that Samuel was actually a force for good. He was a deterrent that was preventing the bitterness and the hatred of Saul to be vented upon him. And he knew that the minute that Samuel died, that he was a sort of a buffer between him and King Saul, and that now Saul would make every effort to try to destroy him. So he goes way down into the wilderness. By the way, he gets farther away than Elijah ever did from Jezebel. Now, we have this incident, though, of David and Nabal. I probably should have a eulogy here for Samuel, but Scripture is very brief here at his death. All it does, it says, All Israel gathered together and lamented and wept. Samuel had been a great man of God. No question about that. Outstanding, and he was the bridge between the judges and the king. He was actually the last of the judges and the first of the, shall I say, professional prophet or the office of prophet. There had been many prophets before Samuel, but he represents now an office that will follow through all the way through the Old Testament and into the New Testament, by the way. Now, we have before us here a man. Well, I think maybe we better let the Word of God tell us all about him. 
I'm begin reading now at verse 2 of First Samuel 25. And there was a man and man whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance, but the man was curlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. Now, not all of Caleb's offspring turned out well, as you can see from this man here. It was Emerson, by the way, who said to be great is to be misunderstood. And certainly this applies to David. As we've said, he was great and he was misunderstood. And the world does not know David, therefore it misjudges him. When the name of David is mentioned, immediately why there is called to mind his heinous sin. And there are those that inquire, how could David commit such a sin and how could God say He's a man after God's own heart. And we'll have an occasion to answer those questions. But instead of questioning God's choice, we ought to investigate David's character, really. And you will find that only those that are small and little will be the critics of this man. I think that David is one of the most lovely characters in Scripture. And to know David is to love him. I know of no man who presents such nobility of character as he does. Now, he had a checkered career. He was born a peasant boy in Bethlehem of Jesse of the tribe of Judah. He was brought up a little shepherd boy among fine brothers older than he was. He was passed by, but God hadn't passed him by. God knew his heart. And God doesn't look on the outward side. God knew this boy's heart. He was anointed king by Samuel, and he slew Goliath the giant. He was a musician. He's called a sweet psalmist of Israel. And he penned the most beautiful poetry written in any language or sung in any tongue. And if you doubt that, have you anything to put down beside the 23rd Psalm? And this man, David, married a princess, Micah, daughter of Saul. He was loved by Jonathan, the son of Saul. Never did a man have a friend like Jonathan. And David had such a friend. And he became an outlaw, a sort of a Garibaldi. And during that time, he gathered to himself a band of men, and they lived in a mountain stronghold. He played mad like Hamlet on one occasion. He became finally king of Judah, then of Israel. And we're going to see his own son led a rebellion against him, and he was forced to flee. And he lived to see Solomon, his son, anointed king. Now, instead of looking at David and Bathsheba and seeing David's sin, I want you to look at something else, and not at David and Goliath and seeing his heroic accomplishment or David and Jonathan and analyzing friendship. This chapter here has a very simple story, but it's a story of life. And it reveals the inmost recesses of his soul, of this man David. It's the story of David and Abigail, and it reveals how human this man David really was. Now, the name Nabal means fool, And how in the world the man got that name, I don't know, but he sure lived up to his name. But after all, aren't we all born fools? The Scripture says man is born like the wild ass's colt. Foolishness is bound up in our hearts. You want to look at your own life for a few moments? Did you ever do anything foolish? I think all of us have. And we'd rather not think about those things, would we? Well, Nabal was a fool, but he was a rich man. He had no honor or honesty. He was a drunken beast, and he was a cabite, that is, he is a dog. But he had a beautiful wife, an intelligent woman, and that's a rare combination, but it's a pleasing one. And the question is, how did this man get such a jewel for a wife? Dr. McConkie calls the story of Nabal and Abigail, Beauty and the Beast. And I think 
frankly, that her parents had made the match. They were impressed by the man's wealth. And here's a case of beauty was sold for gold, and here's a traffic in a human soul. Somebody says, that's terrible. Happens all the time in our contemporary culture. But how often this has happened today, we actually don't know. But a sordid story we have here, and this is what happened. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did share his sheep. That's verse 4. And David sent out ten young men. And David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And what happened, and I'll tell this part of the story, David was protecting this man. You see, David had quite an army with him. And he could have robbed this man of his sheep. He could have taken them, but he didn't. He protected them and kept the thieves and marauders from getting them. And he did many things to assist this man. And now David needs food. And so he sends his young man to this man to ask for help. And we read in verse 9, And when David's young man came, they spake to Nabal, according to all those words in the name of David, and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who's David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. And of course, what he's doing is saying that David has betrayed this man Saul and that he is disloyal. And then listen to Nabal in verse 11. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I've killed for my shearers and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all those sayings. And David said unto his men, You know, David, I told you at the beginning he was red-headed. He's hot-headed. He's angry now. He says, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And there went up David about 400 men, and 200 abode by the staff. And one of the young men told Abigail and Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master. And she knew what he's going to do. So she got together a great deal of food stuff. We're told in verse 18, Then Abigail made haste, took 200 loaves and sheep, and ready dressed all of that, and raisins and cakes of figs. And she goes out now to meet David before he gets to Nabal, because David would have killed him. Now will you notice verse 21? Now David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good. So and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave all that pertain to him. Well, I'm not going to read the rest of it. You can read it, but you're going to find out he's going to kill every man that is among this man, Nabal. And Abigail went to meet David, and she lighted off of her ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground, fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. Says, Take your vengeance out on me. And David's not about to do that. She's a beautiful woman to begin with. And these two confront each other. And she's an outstanding, noble woman. And she says that my Lord shouldn't have done that. And then she says concerning David, you are God's man. And I want to tell you, friends, David begins to see things a little differently. And he doesn't carry out a vengeance that he should never have carried out. But I see her time is up. I hate to quit right now, but we got to wait till next time to see how this is going to work out, my friend. Until then, may God richly bless you. Well, I certainly don't blame you if you want to read ahead and find out what happens, so go ahead and do that. To get your copy of our reading schedule bookmark so you can do it on a regular basis, just visit ttb.org or call 1-800-65-BIBLE. Next time, we'll see that although David had many faults, he was a man after God's own heart. 
And we'll find out why as the Bible Bus continues on its five-year journey through the whole Word of God. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving a seat just for you and whoever else you might invite to join us. we got plenty of room for everyone. Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?